Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders, um, the founders you've heard of, some you've never heard of. You know, Josh, what I love hearing is the challenge, low moment stories, like P90X founder, Tony Horton. Yeah, he's made hundreds of millions of dollars by selling DVDs and other things, but he talked about when he was trying to make food and rent money, uh, when he went cross country, he uh, was the street mime. So he put his head on the street, and whatever money he made there, he would have to pay for his food and rent. Um, Baby Einstein founder Julie Clark talks about growing her business um, to $20 million with five employees and selling to Disney. But she also, most impressive part was she beat cancer twice in that journey. And uh, Atari founder Nolan Bushnell, who was Steve Jobs' mentor, talked about when Steve Jobs offered him 33% of Apple for $50,000 and why he said no to that. Uh, so you can check out inspiredinsider.com uh, for more episodes. And <clears throat> this episode is brought to you by Rise25, which I co-founded with my business partner, John Corcoran, and we help B2B businesses connect to their Dream 100 clients and referral partners and help you run your podcast so it generates ROI. Um, and you know, for me, and Josh has a, a great podcast too, um, and, for me, it's a lot more personal than just business. It was inspired because my grandfather, uh, who was a Holocaust survivor, him and his brother were in concentration camps in Nazi Germany, and they were the only people of their family to survive. And the, actually, the legacy of him lives on because the Holocaust Foundation did an interview with him, and um, I put it on my about page. And I watch it multiple times a year. And it's crazy, the stories, and it gives me gratitude, appreciation for my life and what I go through. But it, um, it makes me think when I have people like Josh Funger on, you know, it's, it's not just about the content, it's about leaving a legacy and people hopefully be able to watch this for years to come. And so I do credit podcasting as the single best thing I've done for my business and my life. Um, and I do think every business should have a podcast, period. So if you have questions, you want to start one, you can email us, uh, support at rise25media.com, um, and you can learn more at rise25.com. And uh, I'm excited to introduce today's guest. Before I introduce today's guest, who is a master at Work the System, and I always learn something when I talk to him, um, I want to give a big shout out to Dan Cashel. Um, Dan Cashel. I mean, I knew of Josh and his work, and, and um, we had a, a dinner in Arizona, and Dan Cashel invited Josh to come to the dinner, and we were be able to connect more intimately. And so thanks, Dan, for ultimately introducing me to Josh. And um, Owen at SweetProcess.com uh, also reintroduced Josh and I as well. So shout out to Sweet Process and their podcast. So today we have Josh Fonger, uh, who is the CEO of Work the System. His consulting firm, Work the System, WTS Enterprises, has attracted over 100,000 business owners from over 50 countries. Josh has personally consulted or coached over 500 business owners from more than 100 industries. And this can range from small startups to really large $500 million enterprises. And what I find is he has the unique ability of developing and implementing systematic solutions to really complex problems. And you can check out the book, Work the System, The Simple Mechanics of Making More and Working Less. Um, it's, it's written by Sam Carpenter. And Sam basically said that there's nobody in the world who's better equipped at helping business owners implement Work the System than Josh. So Josh, thanks for joining me. I'm glad to be here. You know, there's so much we could talk about. There's, you know, we'll talk about the Work the System methodology. We'll talk about you know, um, the influence of Sam Carpenter, but, um, in this day and age with the craziness of the world, whenever you're listening to this, maybe there's some crisis going on, but as we're recording this, there's, uh, you know, the world isn't shut down as we know it, but we're kind of homebound and, um, hacks for homeschooling is really what I've retitled this after talking to you, but Josh has been, they have always homeschooled their kids. And, um, and we were talking out, you know, before we hit record and he's like, People think 
uh, people who homeschool their kids are weird and because they are weird. But, so what did you mean by that? <laughs> uh, yeah, well, I, I don't deny that. Um, um, growing up, my goal was always to be, well, I think everyone is to kind of conform to be normal. But once we started homeschooling, we, we kind of decided on purpose that we were going to be different on purpose, but, but be purposeful with how we're different. And so, uh, yeah, we started homeschooling. Um, I got three kids. My oldest is 14. Um, three boys. And uh, just early on, my wife was like, uh, she is, um, she's really driven. Uh, and she's really driven to do what's right. Not necessarily what is easy or what is normal. Yeah. Uh, and homeschooling is not easy. Believe <laughs> it is like, it's and a so, nightmare in our house, but go on. Yeah. And so she, um, she was doing all this research and this is, this is like, yeah, this is like 13, 14 years ago. And she's like, we should homeschool. And I'm like, what are you, ta- what are you talking about? Homeschool. Mm. And, um, and it took me a few years to warm up to the idea. Why but, did she um, say that? Uh, she had, uh, well, not to go into a long story, but she was a, mm. a semi-professional ski racer, downhill ski racer. And so she oh. always traveled with tutors. And mm. um, so she was always different parts of the world traveling and she, she's broken most of the bones in her body, multiple concussions broke her oh. back. And so she stopped racing, but she was on the uh, pre-Olympic team, uh, very competitive. Oh. And so she just knew that um, you didn't have to do it like the normal way. <laughs> there are a lot of ways to learn. And um, at first, and she like, didn't do it the normal way. So she no. was forced because of her skill set. Yeah. She had to be on the road. Yeah. A couple hours of tutoring a day was all that they needed to, uh, and she's, she's quite smart. And so, um, Anyway, so that kind of opened the door to her mind to the possibility mm. of it. But then uh, two of our kids are special needs. And so uh, when our first one was born, we knew that a normal approach was just not going to work at all. So we knew that from the beginning. And so that got us creative uh, kind of thinking about options. And, um, you know, he has some major difficulties with a lot of things. But uh, also he has major brilliance with certain things. Like the, the, first, the first, uh, first time you read... Um, and most people wouldn't believe me, but he was, he was like, you know, one and a half, two years old, somewhere in that range. Wow. And we were, I was driving around in the shopping cart, the grocery store. And he points out, he says, cold beer. <laughs> and I'm like, cold beer. And on the wall, you know, this big sign says cold beer. And I'm like, oh, those, that's my, that's the first reading of my son. Is, is the word Did that even hit you that he was actually reading at that point? Because you it, taught well, him to read. I mean, you read with him, right? But yeah, it's a lot of reading with him. But, but those were, that was the first like just spontaneous reading and I don't drink. So that <laughs> was just funny that uh, that was the, the first time I was like, huh, my son's reading. And so he, he really picked up on things really early for some things and then really late for other things. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, he's probably uh, five years ahead in math right now but maybe like uh, multiple years behind on <laughs> some other things that it probably wouldn't want me to mention. Uh, but, <laughs> you know, just, I think kids grow differently. And so we, we took a very, um, uh, I guess, custom approach, which is, which is difficult, which is time consuming. Uh, and I would not say it's for everybody or even for most people. Um, it wouldn't fit in their lifestyle, but because of um, being an entrepreneur and working from home, it's given us a lot of flexibility to to do it and i think like we mentioned now everyone's kind of forced into doing it and uh there's a lot of unsavory parts <laughs> of homeschooling which is the interruptions the um the fact that your kids are are only 10 feet away at all times so so it does it does pose some work challenges you know now that you say that josh it makes perfect sense because no matter who you are i mean whether you have special needs or you don't you're you're going to be at different levels in, in different top subjects Oh, right. Yeah. But we're kind of thrown into uh, one size fits all. Yeah. Which, I mean, one size fits all is, is efficient uh, for a society, of course. Right. Um, but if you have options and means and you, you want something different, then um, you know, of course a one to one approach is, would be better. And what really changed my paradigm, I think um, uh, his name is Art Robinson. Now he has um, some very, extreme political beliefs, which I think most people, well, who knows, who knows your audience, but not everyone's going to follow that. But I met this guy in Oregon, uh, which was a profound paradigm shift for me, which was, uh, he had, I think he had like six or seven kids. Um, and his wife died and his, his oldest kid is like, um, nine. And he says, you know what? I'm going to teach my kid. He's a brilliant scientist. Um, I'm gonna teach my kids to teach themselves 
And so he would spend less than one hour a day teaching all nine of his kids and maybe a six kids. I think it's six kids. Anyways, they all like became like PhDs. They all got full ride scholarships. Mm. They all taught themselves, like self-taught. Mm. So instead of him teaching, he said, here's what I need you to do. And they mm. went to the library, got the books, taught themselves, soft, self-taught, taught each other, and all got full ride scholarships. And they created their own homeschool curriculum mm. based on materials that were pre-copyright, so like 1950 and earlier. Mm. And they created their own homeschool program that you can buy. I think they made, I don't know, I've, I'm not quoting this properly, but maybe millions of dollars off of the own, like they built their own digital product, like in the early, early 2000s. Mm. <laughs> the kids built the product and sold it. Is it a good resource? Like what, where should we, oh, where I should people I find it? Oh, okay. I, I mean, they could look it up, but that, that yeah. was just a paradigm shift for me about 10 yeah. years ago was I was like, huh, so you don't actually have to teach every single thing to your kids. Actually, you just need to give them the right standards, standards, the, the morals, the, um, the right beliefs, right? As their leader, you have to lead them and coach them, mm -hmm. but you don't actually have to teach them if you let them. So he basically said, if I can teach my kids to read and to write, they can do everything else themselves. And that, that was it. Hmm. And uh, it was pretty amazing. I was like, wow, you can really do that. He's like, yeah, yeah, definitely. Because he still worked eight hours a day. How did you come across his work? Uh, it's a long story, but I won't go into all of it. But basically, uh, because of the fact that I was helping Sam on some of his political endeavors, oh, maybe like seven, eight years ago, um, we met him through Oregon as we were mm. traveling the state. So it was random. It's not like you were like, I'm looking for homeschooling resources and it came up. Totally random. Yeah, wow. totally random. Uh, and so, and I think the other thing that is, it shows the uniqueness, I think, of each person. And if they're willing to step outside the matrix for just a second, which is a scary place because you're different than everyone else, there's a lot of possibilities in terms of, um, it was crazy. So I went, I mean, we're really going off on a tangent here, <laughs> but I mean, we visited his house, right? Yeah. And uh, his kids had a fascination with um, uh, organs. So they would travel around and they would, uh, they would get like human size or, or pipe animal organs. organs. No, like oh, oh. Uh, the musical organs. Oh, okay. I was going to say this is like, like okay. and so uh, in their house, they had like eight organs that they had actually purchased like from churches that were just falling apart. And then they would rebuild all of the pipe organs, which are gigantic. And uh -huh. they would, they would tune them by ear. And it was like, just because why not? <laughs> why not? That was like one of their projects. And I was just like, that's, um, that is very strange. And so we mentioned homeschoolers are odd. I would say that's definitely true. Uh, but um, it, <laughs> anyways, the point is it opened up my mind the fact that it doesn't require that I have to actually teach eight hours a day. But I do have to actually give my kids a structure, direction, uh, and coach them. And then they can then grow into um, what, what they're meant to be. And um, that can definitely look more divergent than just, this is the curriculum every mm -hmm. single day. I want to talk, hit on the structure and the standards because sure. I think that applies universally, you know, to us, to our business and talk about the structure for a second. How does your wife sure. structure or you structure the, the, the day? Sure. Yeah. Well, so I think the, um, the main thing is for anybody, this is for business, for life, is to kind of know where you're trying to hit. You know, what, what, is, what is the goal? What yeah. does the win look like? And then to kind of work your Not way Not pulling backwards. my hair out. Is, is yeah. Goal. No, I'm just <laughs> <laughs> and then it's to uh, build, you know, build a series of things. So we use, we use checklists and schedules for our kids. Uh, for a while there, I was using Todoist uh, with my kids. But um, we just line out the specific things uh, and the specific times, just like you would in any other uh, school, I guess you'd, you'd say, and um, allow the kids to check them off. And when they get a certain number of checks done, they can reward themselves with, with certain things that they enjoy doing. Uh, but it's, it's curated as opposed to just do whatever you want. Uh, it's very much like here are the things that, that must get done. And then we, we lay them out in the list. And then once you get all these things done, then you can do these things that you probably find more pleasurable than doing math. Um, so um, we print off a daily checklist and then hand it out to the kids and say, go for it. Right. And most of it is self-directed, self-teaching. Um, elements are online, elements are books, elements of all being outside. And then they have to 
you know, knock those things off. And so that has to do with, you know, their spiritual development has to do with their physical development has to do with, you know, the mathematical, historical. And so they're, There's they're different categories. Yeah. Different categories of what we want to make sure that they are growing in. And so, you know, different people are going to have different things. You know, so if you want your kid to be an artist, you're going to spend a lot more time doing art, our work. We, we know our kids are not, not going to be artists. <laughs> right? So we're not spending a ton of time on painting and drawing unless maybe they're making a card for their, for their mom. Uh, but beyond that, that's not like a big focus for our family, but another family, they might have the kid do uh, three hours of piano a day. Right. So um, I think that that, it gives you the flexibility. And so each of our kids have different strengths, different weaknesses and different interests. And like my oldest son really enjoys uh, creative writing. Like he's writing a book right now. Mm, so nice. he, that, that's one of the things he wants to spend more time on. And that's a good use of time. If he said that one of his dreams was being a video gamer, then I probably wouldn't give him a whole lot of time to <laughs> push that, to push that skill set, right? So. You're like that's from you know nine a m nine p m to like one a m you could do your <laughs> gaming um so are there any categories that you people should consider maybe there aren't like the typical ones are you know writing, reading, math are there any ones that you would urge people to think about that maybe we haven't thought about oh subjects yeah like, um, yeah, exactly like you mentioned spirituality. I don't know if people would necessarily lump that into homeschooling, you know, which is interesting. Like, great. Like there should be a section of exploring yeah. that. Right. Yeah. Uh, but, well, so, I mean, as most people know, like every, every college and university uh, primary purpose initially when they were built in the U S was for spiritual development, right. Development and morality. Like that's why all the churches, all the hospitals um, had that as their starting point. So, um, and for us, that's kind of a, an important uh, starting point for the education because like, what, why are we here? What is this for? What is the purpose? Um, and who are you working towards and what are you working towards? So that's an important kind of grounding starting point. So we typically start each day with that, um, mix it into, you know, mealtime and then all, at the end of each day and they have some alone time to do that. So I think that's probably more of a focus on ours than, than most people, but um, mm. that's, I think that's part of the, the challenge of homeschooling. Um, it's like starting a business is because you have a hundred percent control to make as many mistakes or positive things as possible. And you get to, you get to curate it. Like we, we have people who, uh, friends who do homeschooling and they are just obsessed with a certain subject and that's, that's just going to be their thing. That's fine. Right. They get to, they get to choose, right. They have their freedom to choose that. And, um, a lot of people don't, um, I think are, are worried they're going to make a mistake or they are concerned with the responsibility. And so it's just easier to not have to think about those things. Uh, but what I found is that as you're stacking up your, your kids days with, with things that you think are going to be most valuable for them and for their life, um, usually they, um, they still have a ton of free time, <laughs> right? Like uh, if we have our kids do three hours of school a day, they'll still be years ahead of, of their peers because it really doesn't take that long. That's what we're discovering. Yeah. To do most it's like, okay, I finished the two and a half hours. Like, what are you doing in school all day? <laughs> you know? Uh, it, yes. Well, the, it, cause exactly just to be, it's, it is obviously it's partly for education, uh, but partly it's, it's to keep your kids away so you can work eight hours a day. <laughs> so they kind of line up, but um, yeah, so that we want our kids to have tons of times to explore what they're interested in, what they enjoy, what's fun for them, uh, because um, they're not going to have maybe as much time to do that when they're working, and so they have some time to, you know, figure out what what is their skills, what is their uh, boundaries, what are what are they gifted in, and what are they interested in, and it's um, kind of fostering that opportunity. I think is is an important thing, and not everyone has a chance to do that. I had a chance to do that in my work career. Um, similarly. Um, my dad worked the same job his entire life. He was an eye doctor at like 22 mm. and he retired at 65. He was an eye doctor the whole time. Worked in the same location, same business wow. every day, you know, which is better one or two over and over and over and over again. And, um, did you ever think me, about being an eye doctor? I did. And he said, don't do it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I, um, not to say there's anything wrong with that, but he just, I think that he, anyway, that was, was he an optometrist or optometrist? optometrist. Okay. An optometrist. But I, um, I was in real estate development and once I got laid off uh, 2008, um, 
I had this opportunity to basically be unemployed for nine months uh, with a couple of kids. And it sounds scary to me. It was, you know, lost yeah. house, car, Jeez. all savings, all retirement, massive debt, and lived in my in-laws condo. It was pretty bad. Um, <laughs> but but um, what I did get is I got nine months of reflection and nine months of, you know, opportunity to really understand what, what do I enjoy doing? What am I gifted and what is the next chapter? And I think a lot of people don't, don't get that. And maybe it's because it's not forced onto them. It was forced onto me. Um, but they don't get that uh, opportunity. A lot of people right now, Josh, it's forced onto them. They, you exactly. know what I mean? So this is a really, really perfect time for a conversation about that. Yeah. And I think, I mean, um, there is the, the need to survive. Obviously you need to pay uh, to have food <laughs> and to have electricity and stuff like that. But um, what I know, you know, found out through that experience is that everything that, that actually matters can't be taken from you. Um, you know, friends, family, when you faith. get laid off. Yeah. yeah. When you have nothing left. I mean, for Christmas, we went to Walgreens and we looked at toys and played with them in the, the, but we didn't buy any of them. We just went home <laughs> because we had no money. Right. Um, so, but all you of find the things, creative workarounds. Yeah. But all the things that, that mattered, um, they can't, I mean, can't be taken away from you when your job is taken away from you. And so that, um, you know, your, your value as a human being, your, your purpose, uh, all of those things that um, are innate don't go away when your job goes away. And so that, that time period was, was uh, I think it was essential in building who I am now because it makes you fearless as an entrepreneur and knowing like, well, what's the worst that could happen? That wasn't so bad. Um, and uh, so it, it, I think that was a really important step as I became an entrepreneur, as I became a business consultant. Um, and also realizing that um, uh, I think that, um, you know, God has a, a unique plan for each person. So in my case, I wrote my business thesis when I got my MBA about why you should never hire business consultants, right? Because I thought that for the most part, they just, they didn't really help people that much. They usually just took their money and gave them boilerplate solutions. Here's a solution I gave to everybody else. Here you go, charge you an arm and a leg and get out the door. And the, um, the long-term effects and solutions didn't usually stick um, because homegrown or internally grown solutions, I, my thesis was they actually worked better, right? And so the only job I could find after nine months of being unemployed was to be a business consultant. And so <laughs> I, uh, you know, after thousands of resumes out there, tons of interviews, um, that was the only one. And so I said, sure, I'll take it. And um, just, just fell in love with the profession and the impact and realizing uh, how important it is to be a catalyst for change, how important it is to tell people see things from an outside perspective, how important it is to, to grow uh, the skills and the tools and the um, abilities of a team from the outside that an internal team just can't do or can't do as fast. And so that's really been what I've done over the last 10 years and meeting Sam Carpenter, which you know, we're getting to the kind of the, maybe the, <laughs> the main structure of this, this talk, uh, was there is no structure of this talk. This is, okay. this is just about your journey and the interesting, you know, portions, right? So when I met Sam, um, what I was realizing was I was burning out from consulting. So I was flying from place to place to place. Um, and I was helping people with their inside sales, outside sales. I would do, um, I build people's merchandising plans. Uh, I would help them uh, hiring. I'd help them with firing. I do layoffs. We did, um, several bankruptcies, turn, uh, turnarounds, build out financial forecasts, budgets, um, everything. And uh, it was, as you can imagine, get kind of burned out when you're, you know, you're in, in Tampa and then well, you're it sounds in Bellingham, Washington. Well, you know, taxing, but also sounds emotionally taxing too with the, some uh, of the stuff you're doing. Yeah, it was, it was horrible. Um, it was, I mean, I grew a lot, but... Um, what was the toughest I, situation you had to be in? as far as maybe layoffs or, or helping people with? Uh, the toughest situation, well, there's lots of them. I mean, there's, there's several people that, uh, yeah, it's horrible to watch someone's business get shut down after the have business for, for, you know, for, for decades. Um, the, the turning point for me and the really the big reason why I connected with Sam's message, work the system and, and his whole philosophy was a client that I helped uh, turn around in California and I won't name details about it, but, um, we went in there and had to, to laugh a bunch of people 
uh, we had to restructure it, had to change the strategy, the pricing, liquidate a bunch of um, uh, materials. It was extremely complex, work with them for six months, and then I was like, okay, now they're gonna be successful, right? And you know, cultural redesign, new strategy, and they start to go up. And I'm like, oh, we, we saved that company. And, um, and then a couple of years later, I'm on LinkedIn, and I, the person's picture pops up on my feed. And instead of being the owner of a $5 million multi-location business, he is the salesperson, like a junior salesperson at another, another competitor's company. So he went from owning and having, you know, hundreds of employees to just being a salesperson, right? Like probably what, what he was doing when he was 25, he was, you know, 63 and he was doing that. Mm. And I was like, wow, that implementation didn't work what so happened? well. Well, it's because we didn't actually document the systems that we built. We said, here, here's a system for selling. Here you go. Here is this. We'd hand, you know, spoon feed, hand deliver this thing. And then um, it ended up that none of it stuck, you know, because we didn't actually um, help them grow it themselves, you know. So we didn't, in our, in our philosophy, we changed the owner and the team's mindset. Then we build them a strategy. Then we build them principles and then procedures. And the whole idea is that this infrastructure is going to stay stable. This infrastructure is going to guide you and your team. And whether people come and go or whether you come and go, the business is based on this, this rock, this foundation that is scalable and, and is not, uh, doesn't to- get tossed back and forth. It doesn't fall apart when it has a bad day. Um, you know, one point, one percent leaves. It doesn't totally change your business strategy. That actually that, that strategy is scalable and built to last and it's going to be worth something someday. So we basically, we put the business over here and the owner is over here as opposed to the owner being the business. And in his case, he was the business. And when he was having a bad day or a bad month, the business was having a bad day, bad month. And um, so Sam's methodology, the work system method, really is the method that I find is, is not, not the sexiest, but it's the most useful for actually extracting an owner from having to be there all the time to building this entity of value production that's scalable that is not required on any one person, but is required for people, is people that are required to work it, good people to work it, but it can then can scale and grow. Can you talk a little bit about the, some of the methodology, you know, for work the system for people who aren't familiar with it? Sure. Yeah. And, and they can get, you know, more information at workthesystem.com or get the book uh, for free there for, for download or audio. But um, the, the, the main components are that owners typically um, see themselves as being the business and they're the reactionary. So they react to all incoming things coming in and they work way too many hours. They're totally stressed out and they don't have good perspective. So the first thing is we help them change their mindset, which we call the systems mindset, which is being outside and slightly above elevated above your business, looking down at it. And you see there's this one system called answering the phone. There's another system called processing a check. There's another system called delivering the package. So each of these separate systems, you see them, right? And you're aware that all of these things, if perfected individually and combined, could make a perfect business that's scalable. So you first need to understand that the business is not based on you always being there. It's based on these systems running well. And so your job is to make the systems run well, not for you to run yourself into an early grave, which is what most owners do and most of them go out of business. So we, we make it not about them or any one person, but about the systems. That's the first piece. The second thing is a, a strategy. We call it the strategic objective. Um, most people are aware that a company needs to have direction, needs to know how they're going to get there. And so we help companies define that, which usually is a pivot. And people who are watching this during the coronavirus time, maybe there's a small pivot you need to make in your business instead of just being entirely physical. Maybe there's a percentage that's virtual or a percentage of your business that now is done online. But we help companies develop that uh, strategic objective to give them clear focus, uh, speed, and they know what they're building then. Uh, otherwise, owners tend to build what the customers want and, and then they just they go all over the place instead of just building a structure and a strategy that's going to endure and scale and grow. So we build that strategic, strategic objective. The next piece is the operating principles. Those principles would be the guiding beliefs, the, the decision-making guidelines for all 
all activities. So whether it's hiring, firing, time management, productivity, technology, how do you decide what is the right choice? And, and you want to empower everybody in the company, including yourself, with these decision-making guidelines so that, um, you know, if there's a spill on the floor, should you clean it up? Or should you wait till the maintenance person cleans it up? Or should you put a sign out there that says, somebody clean this up soon? Like, what is the right decision? You know, in your culture, is it, hey, we all get our hands dirty and we take care of things as they happen? Or are you in a culture where, hey, everybody has delegated their roles, mm. don't go into someone else's roles? So it's, I don't know. it kind of goes back to core values. Core yeah. values. Yep, exactly. So that'd be another way to say core values. What and would we be want an example sure. of one of those that how maybe you made a decision or one of the companies you helped made a decision based on operating principle? Uh, yeah. So um, one that we're doing right now is that um, stagnant water is deadly. That's what I like to say is that if you are not going to move forward, you're going to, to fester. Things are going to start to rot. <laughs> you know, it's like a pond. And so this idea of stagnant water is deadly. It means movement is better than no movement and movement's going to define or educate you or inform you on your next movement. So uh, during this coronavirus time, it's not like, well, I guess we should just pause. It's like, no, we should, we're going to keep moving. We're, we're a river. We're going to continue to make content. We're going to continue to podcast. We're going to continue to build our systems. And so we're not uh, stopping because we know that, you know, the, the principle of stagnant water is deadly. Uh, we also have another uh, principle, which is uh, best idea wins. And so with that principle, you know, whether it's our, it's our newest, uh, it's our newest hire or someone who's been with us for a long time, or it's an idea from the outside, or it's a complaining customer, yeah. no matter where the idea comes from, best idea wins. It's not, it's not about whether it's my idea as the owner. Uh, and so this gives everybody the ability to, to speak up and the desire mm -hmm. to speak up and to not, uh, you know, not hold to my idea wins, it's best idea wins, right? And so in, any one of these different um, principles is going to guide the way we make decisions during gray areas, areas that are outside of normal business, right? I mean, the normal processes of your business, those are already defined, but things that are slightly outside or unique situations or exceptions to the rules, you want to um, know how to think about and interpret and um, make decisions based on that. Uh, I've got a client, a dental, dental office where they had a principal all about teamwork and one of their most dynamic employees who was the most bubbly and people loved, they, they realized that she was actually not a team player. She, mm -hmm. um, she, would, she would come and go. She wouldn't keep her work organized. She was disruptive. And they said, you know what? This person just, you know, everyone else is playing to help each other, but this person's really just in it for themselves. And we have to let her go. She's, she's disrupting the team, too disruptive. And so we let mm. her go because of that. Um, so that was one of the unique yeah. firings because it happened at a cheesecake factory. I remember that one. But um, so every principle, at, you want to make sure you apply it. There's not just to put on the wall. They're not vanity principles. They're principles that are going to decide or they're going to inform how you make decisions. I had one client where they had a principle about uh, uh, procrastination. And within that principle, it said... Um, lateness is a form of abuse, hmm. which is pretty strong language. And immediately after they put the principle in place, they were all of a sudden on time for everything <laughs> because this principle uh, helped them change how they operated their business. And they really, it really transformed uh, the repeat customers, their referrals uh, and the experience that, that new customers had because they stopped being late all the time. So um, they can be very powerful. And the last piece is uh, working procedures which is probably what we're, mo we're most known for, which is this concept of everything that you do in a repeatable fashion, you want to have a working procedure, written procedure that tells you how to do it properly uh, so that you can improve the quality by looking at it. You can measure it. You can delegate it. You can cross train it. Um, and as you build these various procedures, working procedures, you're going to build out stability, infrastructure, and and value in your business because then it can grow beyond just the, um, the skills of any one person. So that's the last piece of the puzzle. Thank you. That was, that was amazing. I really appreciate that. And how do you, you know, if you go into a company, do you find that there's companies that don't, I mean, maybe they don't have core values or they have them and it's just, you know, in their desk drawer, they don't abide by them. If, if they mm -hmm. do, and maybe that means they're not, really core values if it's just written on a piece of paper. How does someone, a company 
you know, form them and implement them? Is there a certain starting place for that? Yes, the starting place would be to the owner to believe that there's actually some value in doing it. So a lot of them don't really believe there's value in doing it, and so they don't. Or their owners who think it's going to make um, their company, their, their employees happier or make them look better to their customers. So they'll just write up a quick list of core values. They look, put them on the wall, core values. We're going to be nice each day, and we're going to have a smile or whatever, you know, so they just do it just to do it, to check it off the list. Um, so you really have to decide, is this going to empower, enable my team to do the best work? And is it going to allow me as the owner to not have to babysit? Like I don't have to babysit anyone on my team because I say, here, here's our strategy. Here's our principles. If you follow this, this strategy, these principles, you know, whether you're programming some new automation or you're designing something or you're writing something, you're going to be really close <laughs> to how I would do it because um, this is my mind and my team's mind best attempt at de determining where we're going to go and how we're yeah. going to get there. And so it's extremely valuable for efficiency. So um, I think that principles get done if the owner actually believes they're valuable, they don't get done if they don't. But then from a practical standpoint, once they are done, you have to talk about them. You have to bring them up during a weekly meeting. You have to actually, um, bring them as part of your onboarding for your new team. You have to um, continue to go back to them. So when someone makes a mistake, um, so uh, let's just see. Um, oh, so one of our one of our principles is uh, business for grownups, right? So if we're trying to sell to somebody and we're like, gosh, this person just is on the fence or not seem to, it's it's because we we sell to people who are mature business owners. We sell to people who actually are mature enough to invest in their infrastructure to scale. So if we're having a hard time with somebody and they're not improving, it's because they actually didn't fit one of our core values, right? They're, they're actually, they're not, uh, <laughs> they're, they're not, they're not the right maturity, right? And so we, we kind of um, have to bring up those principles on a regular basis to remind ourselves of, of who we are and what, uh, what lane we want to stay in. Uh, and so I think that that's it. The other thing that owners have a trouble with, if I was going to hit on some more, would be um, they're not good at writing, which is fine. And so they think that they have to produce all the principles. And I think that their, their ideas and input matter and in their leadership, but they can have someone on their team or a writer come in and write some of these principles for them, right? So just because something's important doesn't mean you have to do it yourself. Mm. And we really want to encourage our owners. That's why we have consultants and procedure writers to help companies. They say, gosh, Josh, this sounds awesome. I know that most owners don't want to do help this. Us. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but they know it's important. And so that's where we come into, whether it's through training or having a consultant do it or a procedure writer, we come in to help fill in the gaps where they're, they're just not going to do that one piece. Um, but they, they still want to lead it and they know it's important. And I think that's, that's really where we try to fit in is to help um, owners make that shift. Yeah, that's huge. And, we are always trying to improve this part of our company and you know we have a all hands meeting once a month and we will talk about some of the core values and we should make decisions on and we have people kind of tell if they've noticed one of the someone demonstrating one of those core values and, and kind of give some examples a way to reinforce it in our minds and one of them is you know always work with nice people and um but that means clients and uh, staff. And if someone, a client is not being nice to one of the staff, I don't care who it is. It's not someone, you know, we want to work with like, you know, and so we've had to let clients go because they were just, I wouldn't say use the word abusive, but like sometimes people are really strong with their language via email that they wouldn't say in person. And it just is, is not fun. And so, yeah, it, it's definitely something that we are always trying to improve on. Um, and it helps them make decisions on, like you said, the teamwork thing is a great example, right? Mm -hmm. are, are someone from the team not, not, not nice can mean a lot of different things. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, so thank you, yeah, for reinforcing that and, and pointing that out. Um, you know, so Josh, people can check out workthesystem.com. I have two last questions for you. Sure. Um, but I want people, you know, point people towards that, that resource and um, also give a shout out for your podcast. They can check that out. Where else should we point people towards work the system? Where can they find the podcast and, and any other places we should point people towards? Uh, sure. Yeah. I mean, whatever social media platform they're on, they could look up work the system uh, or me, Josh Fonger, but then our, our main 
you know, the main place we send people is our website because then we can get the most resources or podcasts is there, blog posts. Um, they can see any of the, you know, I used to have a big, big problem with selling years ago, but I realized that the only way I can really help somebody is to, <laughs> is to sell them something to get them to move. And so, uh, yeah, all of our products that are available for sale are there. And that's what we're do. That's what we're here what for. What are some of the helping. things that you have? So they, um, what are some of the I guess ways to engage with the work the system? Some sure. of the offerings. Yeah. Well, so um, and I don't know when this is going to air, but we are launching a new product. I'm very excited about. It's called Systemized to Thrive. So this is going to air in about four weeks. It'll be live, and that awesome. is designed for owners and you know their owner second second in command, uh, small teams who want to finally. You know, go through this whole method we talked about. They want to go from being working in the business to working on the business. They want to go from um, you know being an employee in their own business to actually owning a business. Uh, so that that helps them through that transition. So that's our kind of really our our lowest way to get in. You know, at least expensive, but uh, I think critical for any any small business. And we got countless testimonials on that one. Um, the one above that would be certification. So if you're thinking, gosh, I want to get certified in what you do. Um, certified business systems managers. Uh, we're offering that in a few weeks. Uh, and that's going to be kind of our, our flagship for those who want to get certified. And then I, I have a team of consultants. So consultants who do this around the world in different verticals and they're certified business systems professionals. And so they are, um, yeah, they're literally doing what I've done the last 10 years. So they're coaching, consulting, flying, and hands supporting. On, like full hands-on approach. Hands-on uh, actually uh, doing it for you. It's a done for you. And, um, you know, whatever it takes. I mean, I, I had this one client who was on the fence about working with me well, six, seven years ago. And, um, you know, uh, he came back seven years later and he's, he's, he was in the exact same spot as he was seven years later. Oh. And he said, well, you're too expensive. And I, I, I did the math. Anyways, I won't go through that. But the whole point is like nothing happened for seven years except for what happened in seven years. His health went tragically downhill uh, major cancer in his company and his, his wife, who was his business partner, they divorced. And I had to help them separate the company, remove half the family. It, it was a it, much harder. It was horrible. Way more expensive. Challenge yeah. seven, seven years down the road. Yeah. So uh, anyways, <laughs> I think that if your ambitions are to get bigger, whether you work with me or anyone else, you're going to have to put the structure in place. Um, so if your ambitions are to stay really small and to, to stay, you know, everything you can touch and feel, then, then our approach is not for you. I mean, just, just know that you have a job and you better show up and not get sick. No pressure. <laughs> yeah, no um, pressure. <laughs> last question or two questions really quickly. I know you have, uh, to go in a couple minutes, but I always ask what's been a low moment and how you push through and what's been a proud moment. And I don't know if that necessarily low moment you would consider when that whole layoff period or not and how you push through what your mindset was then compared to now uh-huh. is obviously more optimistic when you're going through it. It's a lot tougher, I'm sure. Uh-huh. Um, what would you consider a low moment and how you push through? Yeah. Uh, the, probably the low moment was when I first started consulting. Uh, I was it was just paid based on what I what I sold and what I did. I got paid a commission on, and so I was given a list of about three thousand companies. And he said, just call these companies, and anybody you sell, you get half of you get half of it. So I had to build financial forecasts for companies, and it was in December, and I was staying in my in laws' condo, and there was nowhere for me to work except for outside. So I'm sitting outside with a jacket and a hat and gloves on making cold calls on a patio. <laughs> and I had to call 3000 people in December to convince them to buy uh, a $3,000 financial forecast or something like that. <laughs> it was horrible. And um, once I realized that with enough hard work and determination, um, I could make it in the consulting world. Uh, I think that was probably the, the, the low point, but um, I think that was a good experience in terms of realizing that um, if you need to eat, you'll, you'll, you'll figure it out. <laughs> right. And so that was probably the, the starting of my consulting career. And it really helped me to um, uh, learn a lot and realize that books, like you can see books are my friend. So that, that, you know, that month it was like, okay, I read three books on cold calling. I wrote my first cold calling script and then I got to work. And I think that, you know, now whenever I want to learn something new, there's always great resources. Yeah. So that was a big deal. And then in terms of high point, 
I forgot what the question was. Well, um, stick on that for a second. So what are your favorite books uh, of all time or what are some of the ones behind you that you, in any, any category? <laughs> uh, I mean, yeah, I, there, it, I would say find the best books that have been around the longest in the category that you're interested in, mm-hmm. right? There's, there's so many good books and I wouldn't, I wouldn't even be able to direct you into, into one. Uh, this one, you know, this one's a good one. Work the system. Work so the system, <laughs> if you're sure. watching the video, but otherwise now there's, there's, there's a ton. So, um, I don't even want to, I don't even want to recommend one. Um, except it's a children's book. If you've got a children's book, my favorite one to read is uh, a book called Pilgrim's Progress. That's the one that I love reading with my kids, hmm. which, um, so looking at, cause we talked about that in the beginning of the program and that is read people like famous books. Um, there is the most famous book in the world, which of course is, is the Bible, most read book, most published. The second most famous book of all time is the Pilgrim's Progress, which almost no that. one knows. Um, that one of course is written, I think in like the 1700s. That one is a good one. Uh, if you like old English, but, um, Again, business books, I mean, you name it. I mean, a lot of my business books are just on my phone. So I don't even, I don't even have them back there because I just listen to them. Yeah. But I think um, I try to consume a book a week. And I think that that's, uh, books are usually more dense, thorough, and helpful, in my opinion, than, um, than just pithy blog yeah. posts that People are written by. People poured their whole life work into a book, for sure. Yeah. I prefer yeah. books. Um, as opposed to blog posts, as opposed to yeah. trolling the internet, because I think that those are more dense. I just read again, um, just last week with uh, Eric Reese's uh, Lean Startup. It's a mm-hmm. great book, but um, that's kind of important to what I'm doing right now in my business. And so yeah. it was a relevant book. Yeah. Josh, thank you. Everyone check out workthesystem.com. Really appreciate you. All right. Likewise. Thanks, Jeremy. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See, life's like a beach If you find the sand And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand